Good morning. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy and immortal God, as we enter into this holy week, turn our hearts to Jerusalem so that united with Christ and all the faithful, we may enter the city not made with hands, your promised realm of justice and peace, eternal from age to age. Amen. Into Jerusalem, Jesus rode, triumphant King acclaimed. Palm branches spread to honor his way, garments laid down as tokens of praise, shouts of hosanna. God, open our hearts to the Blessed One, so that we may enter the gates of your justice, confessing in our words and in our deeds that Jesus is Lord, now and forever. Amen.
Hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus. Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he spoke to them. Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, spoke. Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus spoke to them. You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. And Peter spoke up. Oh, all becomes deserters because of you. I will never desert you. Truly, I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and agitated. And he spoke again to them. I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, you could not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may come into the time of the trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for a second time and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came back to the disciples. Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. 
Now the betrayer had given them a sign. The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on him and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus spoke to the crowds. Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and asked, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? And they all answered. He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came up to him. You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them. I do not know what you're talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, using the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. 
For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they gathered, Pilate spoke to the crowd. Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized it was out of jealousy that they'd handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. I have nothing to do with that innocent man. But today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas. Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And they all spoke. Let him be crucified. Why? What evil has he done? But they all shouted the more. Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas to them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the road and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, mocked him. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But others spoke up. 
Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who'd fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified. Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people, he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. And Pilate responded, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Paradox. Creation is full of it. Everywhere we look, we can see contradictions, impossibilities, rules bent, broken, twisted out of shape. And I'm not talking about what we humans do. I'm looking at what the creator has woven throughout the world. And therefore also through us, we are full of contradictions. And that is where we find ourselves this Sunday, right in the thick of contradiction and paradox. Like the crowds of ancient Jerusalem, we celebrate with joy, exhilaration, even giddiness, the procession of the Messiah into Jerusalem. We wave our palm branches and shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. In other years, we'd be singing, Oh, glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King. Or maybe we'd be singing, Into Jerusalem, Jesus rode with great gusto as we proceeded into the church, waving our own palm branches. And then, other years, and this year too, we'd listen in silence to the story of the passion, a story of love and betrayal, of generosity and fear, of God's justice versus the world's justice, contradiction, paradox. If we can bear it, we hold that joy and exhilaration in one hand as we open our other hand to grab hold of one of the most painful experiences in the Bible. If we can bear it, we listen with our hearts open, reaching into how it would have been, coming from that joyful procession to standing there only a few days later on Golgotha to watch Jesus be killed. If we can bear it, we can encompass this paradox of joy and grief, love and betrayal, hope and despair if we can bear it. And then we might find ourselves open to the radical generosity 
and limitless love that God has for us humans. Doesn't it echo what we're experiencing now? On the one hand, the beauty of spring, the lengthening of the days, the warming of the air, and it feels so good. And then on the other hand, there's the dark threat of this virus, the closing of businesses, the stopping of paychecks, and all the consequences that come with that. It feels so not good. On the one hand, there's the daily increase in numbers of people dying, of medical staff weeping, of families separated, grieving. And on the other hand, there's the dedication of the medical teams, the kindness of strangers reaching out to help each other, the ever increasing expressions of love and gratitude, exchanged through phones and computers with family and friends. We are truly in a time where light and dark weave together, two powerful forces dancing with each other all around us. It's tempting to simply turn our gaze towards next Sunday, to the celebration of Jesus' resurrection, to the return of life, to the loveliness of our identity as Easter people. Tempting, but why would we shortchange ourselves that way? Why would we skip over the grief and fear the pain and sorrow, which is a powerful pathway into deeper understanding, into fresh insight about our life, into more profound relationship with the Holy of Holies. Here's something I know from my friends who've walked the cancer journey. They tell me when asked, they would never choose to remove that experience from their lives with all its terror, pain, unpleasant medical experiences, because they all found ultimately it enriched them, it changed them. It gave them a deeper appreciation for reality, however it shows up. It honed their sensitivity to suffering in others, and it carved out a deep pool of reception for grace to dance in their lives. So this coming week, I invite you, step into the hard places of this time with courage, with willingness, with all that you are, and ask God, what is it you are wanting to show me? What is it you are wanting to show me? You just might discover a new kind of love that to quote Khalil Gibran, Gibran, your desire becomes to melt and be like a running brook that wings and sings its melody to the night. To know the pain of too much tenderness, to be wounded by your own understanding of love and to bleed willingly and joyfully. Amen.
Caught between joy and despair, we yearn for the fulfillment of God's desire beyond the brokenness and neediness of this life. We offer thanksgiving for God's presence with us and petitions for the transformation of the church and of the world. To the words we pray to you, O God, please respond with, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. As we are separated from one another and asked to remain at home as much as possible, Lord Jesus Christ, teach us to love our neighbor and to care for those in need, as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick, and to assure the isolated of our love, and your love for your name's sake. We pray to you, O God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pay, pray for the people of the Church of the Province of the Indian Ocean and their Archbishop, James Richard Wong Yin Song. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for our primate, Linda Nichols, for our indigenous Archbishop, Mark MacDonald, and for the people and clergy of the Ecclesiastical Province of Ontario and their Archbishop, and Jamon. In our ecclesiastical province, we pray for the Diocese of Kootenay and their bishop, Lynn McNaughton. In our diocese, we pray for Logan, our bishop, and for St. Peter Comox and priest Susan Milne. And on our island, we pray for the people of Our Lady of Grace and St. Paul's Historic and their priest, Father Scott Whit Whitmore. In our parish, we pray, pray especially this week for Sandy and Keith Green, Peter and Mary Grove, Dion Hackett and Cindy Clark, Wilma Haig and Ron Hawkins. We pray to you, O oh God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God in our faith, we pray for reconciliation between the violated and the violent, that we may rest in your peace. We pray to you, O God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. For generosity between rich and poor people everywhere, that we may share the abundance of your creation. We pray to you, O God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. For the growth of love between broken peoples and nations, that we may shape our common life as your kingdom. We pray to you, O God. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. For mutual respect between immigrants and insiders, that we may welcome your image in all who come to us. We pray to you, O God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. For protection for the weak and humility for the strong, that we may serve others as you serve us in Christ. We pray to you, O God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. In this time of pandemic, we give thanks for all caregivers healthcare workers, and medical researchers. Gracious God, give skill, sympathy, and resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom to those searching for a cure. Strengthen them with your spirit that through their work, many will be restored to health. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. For all the joys and concerns of our hearts, that we may live with gladness and trust, please name those for whom you have particular concern this week. Brian Radford, Jackie Roussin, Al Robertson, Tony and Pam Brentnell, Linda and Mike Overholt, Ken Strike, 
Mallory Stewart, Letitia Lane, Nancy and Don McDougall, Gail Hingston, Gordon Chatter, Noreen Davies, and Jim Warren. We pray to you, O God, Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. Life giver, pain bearer, love maker, day by day you sustain the weary with your word and gently encourage us to place our trust in you. Awaken us to the suffering of those around us. Save us from hiding in denials or taunts that deepen the hurt. Give us grace to share one another's burdens in humble service. Amen. Glory to God.
whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Friends, good morning. I am so very pleased to be able to speak to you this morning. I am speaking to you from our home, from our kitchen. And I thank you for the opportunity of coming into your homes to speak to you this morning. During this extraordinary time, we have been challenged to look at what it means to be the church in different ways. What it means to be the church dispersed. So as a diocese, as your bishop, I thank you for the creative and innovative ways that you have been trying to be the church in these days. This day is the beginning of Holy Week, it's Palm Sunday. And as we travel this week, we will be asked again to be creative and to use our imagination as we celebrate each step through this week. Thank you for the liturgies and for the work that you've done in preparation. Gather through Zoom or other means with your family and with your friends. Celebrate the resurrection. Celebrate the fact that Christ is risen and have my blessing. A blessing coming from our home, coming from this kitchen, coming from our hearts to you, to say, we continue to be the church, we continue to be the diocese. Although we're apart, we are one in Christ. May God richly bless you as you journey through this holy week. And the blessing of the God who created you, the Son who has befriended you, and the Spirit who has gifted you, continue to be with you each and every day. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.